As the 1930s begin, the empire of the rising sun, Japan, looks to mainland Asia as a means of expanding their colonial empire and securing the economic gains of the 1920s. In 1931, Japan invades Chinese Manchuria and sets in motion events that will contribute to a global war just eight years from now. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately, humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. After the First World War, the Japanese economy booms. For the first time, it is industry, and not agriculture and crafts, that are at the forefront of the Japanese economy. The government and the military drive this with extensive infrastructure and armament programs, and urban factories draw hordes of people from agrarian life. It's not a sudden development, though. Japan has been transforming since 1867, when Prince Mutsuhito succeeds his father and becomes the Meiji Emperor. His immediate goal is to remove Japan from the struggle for colonial dominion by Western powers that is at that point crippling China. For generations, the emperor had largely been a symbolic figure, with the shoguns ruling Japan since the 17th century. But Meiji now seizes power and starts a series of reforms that will become the Meiji Restoration. It's a long series of military, economic, social, political, cultural, and religious reforms that gradually introduces Western-style law, banking system, military organization, conscription, and education. Meiji replaces the feudal power structure with a centralized, more democratic system of government. Although he formally abolishes the power of the noble lords, the daimyos, and their military elite, the samurai, many of them transition into positions of power in the prefecture system introduced in 1871. Japan now develops into a de facto oligarchy with a more efficient bureaucratic system of decision making. But even the introduction of a parliament and a democratic constitution in 1890 impose few restrictions on what the bureaucrats can do. See, the military and the cabinet ministers don't answer to the legislature, but report directly to the emperor. But military independence is defined in the 1890 Japanese constitution so that the military has no civilian oversight. It answers to the emperor and no one else. To make it even more independent, supreme command, and I mean final say, is given to the general staff, effectively allowing them to act independently from the rest of the state. So. The emperor has neither influence nor oversight over the actions of the military, the political parties have little or no influence over policy making, and the parliament has no influence over anything. But despite the democratic shortcomings, the new system means decisions based on rational, natural, or science-based grounds, at least at first, and improves the efficiency of Japan's governance in almost every field. As a result, throughout the whole period, and accelerating in the 1920s and 30s, the Japanese economy is in high gear. But at the same time, there are clouds gathering in the sky and beginning to obscure the sun that is rising over the empire. Here's the thing. The decrease of the agricultural sector and rapid growth of industry is increasing the demand for imported food and raw materials, most notably rice, oil, and rubber, right? In this way, Japan is becoming increasingly dependent on foreign trade, or production in their colonies in Korea and Taiwan, acquired in the First Sino-Japanese War in 1894 and 1895. As the 20s progress, the volatile global economy makes the Japanese nervous about these dependencies. And this is not a good thing for the bureaucrats, who have managed to keep the population happy with progress. That popular satisfaction is largely due to the lightning speed that Japan has developed into a modern state. In little more than a decade, the Japanese have become used to electricity, trains, cinemas, even baseball stadiums. To maintain the status quo, Japan has to take new measures. The plan they come up with is based on two already existing ideas. Nanshinron and Hokushinron, the Southern Expansion Doctrine, and the Northern Expansion Doctrine, both already formulated in the 19th century. Nanshinron has been practiced since 1875 by expansion into the South China Sea and South Pacific through trade, diplomacy, 
planned migration, and colonization into territories that are viewed by the Japanese as uncivilized or, or at least less civilized than Japan. It began with the declaration of control over the Bonin Islands and a gradual expansion into the Pacific Islands. The 1919 Paris Peace Conference gives Japan control over several former Imperial German colonies like the Caroline Islands, Mariana Islands, Marshall Islands, and Palau. Now in 1931, Nanshin Ron is reaffirmed as doctrine when the government adopts it as official policy. But since the turn of the century, it is actually Hokushin Ron that has been the main doctrine in play. This doctrine is formed in the 1890s with a focus on mainland China, including Korea and the island of Taiwan. This escalates into the first Sino-Japanese War in 1894 that eventually leads to the annexation of Korea and Taiwan into the Japanese Empire. Continued encroachment towards the Western Pacific Rim leads to conflict with Russia and the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 5. Japan invades and occupies Russian Outer Manchuria during the war. But the war almost bankrupts Japan, and as stalemate threatens, they sue for peace. Japan agrees to withdraw in exchange for naval bases in the region. In the Treaty of Portsmouth, they get a zone of influence in the southern part of Manchuria, but not Dominion. At home, the public is enraged at what they see as a waste of money and lives. See, the government had made big promises that the war would be worthwhile as it would surely gain Japan valuable resources for growth in outer Manchuria, if not more than that. And it is in this disappointment that we can find one of the roots of ever-increasing Japanese imperialism in the 20s and 30s. Although it is objectively clear that Japan's failure to secure their goals in the Russo-Japanese War is because of overreach and economic effects, this is not how it is spun in Japan. When the war breaks down, it is the Western powers that intervene to mediate between the belligerents. This effort is led by American President Theodore Roosevelt, who gets a Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts. The Japanese government, on the other hand, rewards him by shifting the blame onto him and the European leaders who are framed as the ones that force Japan out of outer Manchuria. It doesn't create a huge swell of extremism in Japan at this point, but does feed into a growing sentiment of resentment and is used to fuel popular sentiment of being treated unfairly, despite a sense of superiority over other nations in the region. In essence, it's not any different than what is going on in some parts of Europe at the time. The country faces challenges arising from the gradual change from feudalism to parliamentarianism. This is coupled with economic change that creates new prosperity, but also new kinds of disparity and inequality, all while the country is making leaps and bounds forward into the modern age. It's confusing, right? Okay, on one end, there's great progress that inflates a feeling of being ahead in the world, and at the same time, things just aren't that great. And just like in many places in Europe before the First World War, these feelings are channeled into a sentiment of resentment of unfulfilled superiority. For a while, the cool heads of the bureaucrats prevail, but then the Great War comes and Japan is again caught up in a great game of geopolitical chess, this time on the side of the Allies though. But things turn sour again when after the war the Japanese feel snubbed at the Paris Peace Conference. It gets to the point that they break off negotiations and leave the conference in protest. Somewhat ironically, what with Japan's growing xenophobia, their main point of contention is the refusal of the Western powers to agree to Japan's calls for a clause of absolute racial equality to guide the League of Nations. Furthermore, the hawks in Japan are disappointed about what they see as insufficient territorial gains. While the bureaucrats leave Paris, Japan's military is, since 1917, still part of the Siberian intervention together with the rest of the Entente powers. The goal is to secure parts of eastern Russia in support of the White Army during the Russian Civil War to support a defeat of the communist Bolsheviks. Japan's motives here are unclear or at least lack consensus within the government straight from the beginning. On one hand, there's the ideological goal of fighting communism which is perhaps the only thing all Japanese leaders agree on. 
On the other hand, some of them want to pursue the goal of securing the territory that wasn't won in 1905, which is in direct conflict with the idea of supporting the white army to hold the territory, which is paramount to stop the Bolshevik advance. While the rest of the Entente declare defeat in 1920 and leave, Japan goes it alone all the way up to 1925. By then, the Soviet Union is an established fact, and the Japanese occupation is a big obstacle for establishing any diplomatic relations with their new communist neighbor. During these five years, the Siberian intervention is just one of many issues that pit the militarist factions of the imperial bureaucracy against the more diplomatic administrators. There is more popular support for Japanese chauvinism and calls for revanche for the unfilled goals of the past years. At the same time, modernization has also given birth to increased liberalism with modern women calling for emancipation and young people less concerned with hierarchic ancestral culture. Very much like in the West, the counter-reaction is a growing faction of reactionaries. The militarists, who are of course also fanning the reactionary and chauvinistic attitudes, now increase their power base. As the 20s progress, they patiently and methodically take control of the Japanese bureaucracy, squeezing out more and more of the more moderate administrators. By 1931, it is now the military that decides what will happen next. With their secure positions inside the imperial bureaucracy, the military now has enormous power over how foreign policy is to be conducted. And the military favors the Northern Expansion Doctrine to escape foreign dependency. They struggle more with the Southern Expansion as they can't exert dominance over the seas very easily at this point. The US has reduced its own Navy after World War I and has demanded and enforced an equivalent reduction of naval power from both Japan and Great Britain to create a better global power balance. Great Britain and Japan are also at odds over dominance in the Western Pacific. So, vastly oversimplified. At this point, the military sees a land-based expansion on continental Asia as more promising for success. But there, the Soviet Union has been expanding its military presence, and the rise of Chinese nationalism poses a second threat. Now, military action against the Soviets is not an option that promises success in any case, and a war with China would mean worsening relations and potentially even sanctions by the USA, on whom Japan at the moment depends for much of its raw materials and oil. So at first, Japan focuses on securing their economic interests in their allotted zones of influence, such as the South Manchuria Railway Zone. In fact, 68% of Japan's foreign investment by 1927 goes to Manchuria. But the deterioration of the European empires after World War I and American isolationism created a power vacuum in East Asia. When Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek openly vows to increase his control of Manchuria in April 1931, the militarists in Japan are more than willing to use the power vacuum to go into action. Ah, but first, they need a casus belli, a viable reason to go to war. But you know, if there isn't one, you can always invent one. On September 18th, they stage a false flag attack by sending in Lieutenant Suomori Kawamoto of the Independent Garrison Unit with some dynamite to blow up the tracks on the Japanese-controlled South Manchuria Railway near the railway junction at Mukden. The operation is quite silly, actually. The explosion is so weak that only minutes after the detonation, a train passes over the hardly damaged tracks without any problem. But this doesn't stop the militarists who blame the incident on Chinese saboteurs. Only hours after the explosion, the Imperial Japanese Army invades Manchuria. More specifically, the Kwantung Army, the most self-willed Japanese force, invades Manchuria. Now, this is when we truly see the effects of how the independent military and the bureaucracy of Japan have become a self-governing force. You see, the Japanese central government has no part at all in this attack. They are even opposed to it for fear of angering the Western powers. The army makes rapid advances into the province, racking up victory after victory, further robbing the Japanese government of any ammunition to oppose the action. Faced with an inevitable fact, 
and the prospect of completely losing face by admitting they have no control over their own army, they finally decide to support the invasion, including the commitment of more troops. Predictably, this all does indeed disrupt the government's efforts to keep amicable or at least non-hostile relations with the Western powers. By February 1932, Manchuria is fully occupied by the Kwantung and Korea armies. Now, the army favors simply annexing Manchuria, but at this point the government does intercede. Instead, they proclaim the puppet state of Manchukuo and make the last Chinese emperor of the Qing dynasty, Aisin Jioro Pui, chief executive of Manchukuo. In 1934, he will become emperor of Manchukuo. Despite that title, it is a position he holds only to serve the policies and ideology of the Japanese military leadership that will now be a central cogwheel in the machine pulling the world further and further towards a global war. The Kwantung army frames the occupation of Manchuria as the starting point of a widely accepted ideal in Japan, that Japan is to be the one to unite Asia, or at least East Asia. This idea will soon develop into the principle of Hako Ishu, or all the world under one roof. In other words, Japan has now taken the first step towards something like world domination, and the Kwantung army has set out on a path that will inexorably lead to armed conflict with China, the USSR, the European colonial powers, and finally in December 1941, the United States of America. If you'd like to know more about some other developments in the Asian power struggle, you can check out our Between Two Wars episodes about China. The first one is right here, any minute now. Our patron of the week is Jonathan Mingola. Thanks to people like Jonathan, we are able to continue making quality historical content such as this. So do the right thing and join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. And actually... We would like to thank all of you who have been supporting us already because we have reached the milestone of 100,000 subscribers a little while ago, but that was all thanks to you guys. So subscribe, ring the bell, kanpai.